Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me to kick off this session. Um, so today we're going to be spending time talking about unique roles of paleomagnetism and understanding the past. And there's been a lot of really cool work that's being done in understanding the history of the Earth's geodynamo in terms of understanding plate tectonics and changes in uh, continental positions and even to climate in the past, as well as biomagnetism and archaeomagnetism. But a growing amount of attention has been dedicated to the application of paleomagnetism to understand the history of magnetic fields on planets and planetary bodies at large. And so today I'm going to be talking about that in particular in context to the moon. So planetary dynamos are produced by the organized advection of conductive fluid inside a body. And so if you can show that a planetary body once generated a core dynamo, it tells you a few things. It tells you that a planet has undergone a differentiation process to form a metallic core and a silicate mantle. And the second thing it tells you is that there must be some mechanism to sustain advection of the core. So canonically, uh, dynamos are generated by thermal convection of a uh, the metallic outer core, the metallic liquid core of a planetary body. And that process can tell you about the thermal evolution of a planetary body. If an inner core starts to crystallize over time, the growth of that inner core can also provide latent heat and chemical buoyancy that can also help sustain a dynamo. But a third option for helping generate a dynamo could be due to uh, mechanical perturbations of the core, which can cause mechanical stirring of the fluid core, and that can also potentially generate a dynamo. So we're going to be talking about the moon and how its dynamo may have actually um, operated. So in terms of understanding the history of the lunar dynamo, there are a few mysteries involved with the moon. We know that the moon does not generate a dynamo today, but in the past, it seems to have done so. And the questions that we're trying to answer now are how strong was the field generated by that dynamo? How long did the lunar magnetic field last? And how was the lunar dynamo powered? So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk you through a few stages of development of this field. So I'm going to start by talking about the history of lunar paleomagnetism. Then I'll go into the current state of the field and what we know right now. And then third, I'll talk a little bit about avenues for future exploration in lunar magnetism. So to start at the beginning, our first uh, indication that the moon may have been magnetized in the past came during the Apollo era. And one example of this was that the Apollo astronauts took uh, magnetometers with them to the lunar surface on some Apollo missions, and they actually made measurements of the local crustal fields at the different Apollo landing sites. And what they found was that there were crustal fields between three and 300 nanotesla, depending on where you were on the moon. Now, while this is way weaker than the around 50 microtesla field we have on Earth, it nevertheless indicated that there was some kind of remnant magnetization that was present on the moon. And so they didn't just make these geophysical measurements on the lunar surface. The Apollo astronauts also brought back many samples from the moon. And um, what I'm showing you here is a compilation of Apollo era paleo intensity results. Now, you may have seen sort of earlier versions of this plot in previous lunar magnetism talks, but um, this is a new plot that's been generated by my PhD student, Ji and Jung. And what she has done is she's combed through all of the Apollo era data and um, she's plotted paleo intensities for different samples. So each dot is a different sample versus time. And she's updated the ages. She's actually normalized all of the paleo intensities to what we use uh, for modern day calibration constants whenever there are room temperature method paleo intensities. And um, she's also assigned lithologies to each of the rocks that were studied back then. So we can have a better idea of not only what the paleo intensities versus time were, but also what types of rocks were analyzed for different periods in time. So what we find generally is that early in lunar history, there seems to be some evidence that there were strong magnetic fields on the moon, several tens of microtesla to 100 microtesla. And this 
potentially high field epoch looks like it might have ended around three and a half billion years ago, or maybe the field kept declining a little bit past three and a half billion years ago. But there's also a lot of variability even within this high field period. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. Then once you get to past, you know, 3.2 to, you know, more recent times up to a billion years ago, there are paleo intensities of a few micro Tesla that have been brought back from some lunar samples. And so we're also interested in, okay, what is the origin of those younger paleo intensities? What's the origin of the older paleo intensities? Um, during the Apollo era, we established this record, but we weren't necessarily sure even at the time whether these paleo intensities were the product of a lunar dynamo. There were a few outstanding questions involved with this data set. One question was, can giant impacts or basin forming impacts produce magnetic fields? And this hypothesis came about because some of the strongest crustal magnetic anomalies that are present on the moon, so you can see this magnetic map of the moon here on the right, are located at the antipodes of some of the largest impact basins on the moon. So uh, for example, this cluster of anomalies happens to be located at the antipode of Imbrium, this one's the antipode of Serenitatis Basin, and this one's the antipode of Christium Basin. And all of these are also located near South Pole Aiken Impact Basin, which is the largest crater on the moon. So, there was some question as to whether magnetization had nothing to do with the moon at all and was due to exogenic sources. Um, the second question that arose during the Apollo era was, okay, if these magnetizations were not gathered on the moon themselves, is it possible that uh, some of these could be due to contamination that were acquired on Earth? For example, the spacecraft that the lunar rocks were transported back to Earth in may have had some magnetic fields that may have contaminated some samples. Um, are, are the tools that have been used to process the samples, have they always been non-magnetic? Um, another thing that's happened is a lot of moon rocks, in order to avoid um, chemical alteration from water, were cut dry using band saws and circular saws, and those sometimes got hot and they could uh, create a partial TRM. Um, on the surfaces of some rocks during uh, saw cutting, which is also problematic. And another possibility is that these rocks have been stored in the Earth's magnetic field for years and years now. And um, could some magnetization be due to viscous contamination from the Earth's magnetic field? So a lot of these questions were unresolved during the Apollo era, but we have done a lot of work in lunar magnetism, particularly in the last decade or so. And we've made a lot of advances that can help answer these questions. So I'm going to talk about the current state of the field. So the first question that I brought up is, can impacts generate strong magnetic fields? And um, very recently, uh, there was this paper that came out from uh, Rona Oran. And what Rona did was she did magnetohydrodynamic modeling of impact plasma fields. And so if you have a basin forming impact occurring on one side of the planet, these plasmas can kind of roll around the moon. And um, the idea was that this, uh, basically this conductive surface would uh, kind of condense magnetic fields on the opposite side of the moon and lead to amplification. That was the original hypothesis. Um, but what ended up happening when Rora, Rona did these uh, MHD simulations was she found that the fields that were generated at the antipode or even around the lunar crust were less than a hundred nanotesla. Uh, so basically the takeaway message from this is that the fields that are produced by these antipodal impacts are not strong enough to generate the lunar paleo intensity record. So this is becoming less of a concern. Um, then We've also done some revisions to our protocols and how we select and analyze samples now to address some of these other issues. In order to look at the possibility of a kind of isothermal contamination from spacecraft fields or tools, um, we do high resolution AFD magnetization to high fields so we can look and uh, kind of eliminate any low coercivity overprints that may be present in rocks. We also do a detailed research into the saw cutting history of every rock, and now we try to select samples that have not been bandsawed or circular sawed, or if they have, we have them chipped from the interior of rocks very far away from the bandsawing and circular sawing locations. 
And we also conduct BRM, viscous permanent magnetization acquisition experiments on our samples to see how much of their NRM could be from the Earth's field. Another thing that we do is we constrain the shock history and the thermal histories of the rocks that we study. We do exhaustive shock petrography to make sure that um, there's no petrographic evidence of shock in the samples that we're looking at. So that limits shock pressures to five gigapascals or so, um, which is relatively weak in the grand scheme of things. And then we also do detailed argon-argon thermal chronometry for samples. So we can do step heating and we can see in the black what the step heating profile looks like for a given sample. And we also do thermal modeling of different heating conditions to see you know, what peak temperatures during day-night cycling or as a result of impacts that different rocks could have experienced that could have affected or not affected their magnetization. So in this case, for example, um, they showed that this rock experienced kind of an average of 90 degrees C on the lunar surface from day-night cycling, and that was all the heat it got after it formed. So that's not going to affect the magnetization. So um, the next thing that we have done, which is different from the Apollo era, is we have a real focus on understanding the high coercivity magnetization components that are present in samples. On the left here is an example of some Apollo era data for sample 10049 and Apollo 11 Mare basalt. And what they used to show back then was they used to show the AFD magnetization profile of a couple different subsamples of a rock. And so here's two different subsamples. And then they would also re-impart that rock with a saturation isothermal remnant magnetization, basically applying the strongest field to that rock and looking at the SIRM that is retained. And then they AFD magnetize the SIRM as well. And incidentally, the way most Apollo era paleo intensities were determined was they simply took the ratio of the NRM at 20 millitesla, which is 200 Gauss, um, and they divided that by the value of the SIRM for the same sample at 20 millitesla, and they multiplied it by a calibration constant, which nowadays we use a value of 3,000 microtesla, and that gives you the paleo intensity. Um, as you can guess, there might be some issues with this, is it's just a one-point paleo intensity record. And by 20 millitesla, you're not sure whether that's actually the high coercivity magnetization in a sample or whether that is an overprint that just simply has not been removed by 20 millitesla. What we do nowadays is we do high resolution AFD magnetization and also high resolution of the NRM and also of SIRM, and we fit a slope to the NRM versus SIRM at very high AF levels in the sample. So we are not looking at overprints. We also now measure multiple mutually oriented specimens from each rock um, so to make sure that the magnetization in a rock is unidirectional. So for example, in Apollo sample 15498, we looked at 12 mutually oriented specimens from five parent ships and found that they were all unidirectionally magnetized. Another great advance in um, the way that we have been doing lunar paleomag recently is the development of controlled atmosphere heating in labs. Whenever we want to do thermal demagnetization experiments, we cannot just conduct them the same way we do for earth rocks, which is heating them in just air or maybe heating them in nitrogen. Um, because the Earth operates in a different oxygen fugacity regime than the Moon. The Earth is a more oxidizing environment, so our environment is several log units above the iron with site buffer. But on the Moon, generally, the oxygen fugacity is one log unit below the iron with site buffer. So instead of forming minerals like magnetite, the Moon's rocks contain iron-nickel alloys, such as camisite and martensite. And so in order to make sure that those minerals don't alter during heating, um, new controlled atmosphere uh, ovens have been developed. So the paper describing this is Suave et al. 2014. And we're able to use hydrogen and carbon dioxide gas mixtures to actually reproduce the environment on the moon, this iron was type minus one um, oxygen fugacity. And this approach has been successfully used in rocks from a couple different studies now. So here's thermal demagnetization of Apollo sample 15498. 
and we were able to successfully heat this rock and thermally demagnetize it. And it showed that this rock, you know, could have a stable component of magnetization removed up to about 700 degrees Celsius. Um, then we were also able to do Tellier Tellier paleo intensity analysis that passed all PTRM checks and quality statistics. And um, we got a five micro Tesla Tellier Tellier paleo intensity for this rock. So all in all, using a combination of alternating field demagnetization and thermal demagnetization and both room temperature and thermal paleo intensity methods, we've been able to build a modern paleomagnetic data set for the moon. And so the way to interpret this now is I'm just going to overlay our thoughts about it. There seems to have been some evidence of an early dynamo field with intensities of a few to a few tenths of micro Tesla. Then there, from studies of several Mari basalts, there is evidence of a high field epoch of several tens of micro Tesla. Down here, there's a few samples that have downward arrows. Those are samples where no stable dynamo records were retrieved, but based on their rock magnetic properties, we were able to assign upper limits to what the field could have been if uh, what the field would have been if it had been around. So the field cannot be stronger than whatever each dot is. Um, then later on, we have this one sample of 15498, which has a five micro Tesla latent lunar history between about two and one billion years ago. So maybe there's a weak field era here. And then last year in a paper um, out of MIT, they studied two Apollo 15 breccias that were not magnetized at all, were really high fidelity magnetic recorders, and they were not magnetized. So that tells us that the dynamo likely ceased by about one billion years ago. So that's our current understanding of the history of the dynamo. But there's an issue in particular with understanding this so-called high field epoch on the moon. And the reason is that thermal evolution models of the moon suggest that it's very difficult for a convective dynamo, either from thermal convection or thermochemical convection, to generate fields that are greater than a few micro Tesla for the entirety, for even a short period of time, not to speak of hundreds of millions of years of lunar history. And so um, normally dynamo uh, kind of simulations from thermal evolution say the field should be one micro Tesla or less. Um, so getting strong fields is hard to do. One way to look at it um, was done by my colleague, Alex Evans at Brown University. And what Alex did was he basically assigned the moon a uh, lunar core uh, a adiabatic threshold at the core mantle boundary of zero um, milliwatts per meter squared and said, OK, let's see how we can generate fields uh, from lunar convection using contributions from thermal energy, gravitational and latent heat, and radioactive energy that might be present in the core energy budget. What he showed was if you have an adiabatic threshold of zero, you can generate a very weak field for most of lunar history. Again, this might not be a real problem. This could be potentially achievable. But to get fields during the high field epoch of several tens of micro Tesla, you have to start dipping into additional energy sources, such as gravitational and latent energy. But to get to fields of several tens of micro Tesla, 50 micro Tesla, you have to use like 12 times the estimated radiogenic element budget of the lunar core. It's not feasible, um, strictly speaking, to have a continuously operating thermal convection dynamo. So it, what this tells us is that convection unaided cannot readily explain what we see in the high, early high field epoch. And this has motivated studies in kind of unconventional dynamo mechanisms to try to figure out whether there's some other possible dynamo mechanism that could have explained the high field epoch. And so what people have looked at are the ideas of transient dynamos generated by basin forming impacts, which can cause mechanical perturbations of the fluid outer core. Um, people have looked at whether precession or differential rotation of the core and mantle or the inner core and outer core could generate um, dynamo magnetic fields. People have even looked at the possibility of a basal magma ocean being sufficiently conductive enough in generating the magnetic field in the moon. And so this is a dynamo which would not even be operating at the core. So all in all, um, 
there are some possibilities that could work. The procession dynamo may be able to reach strong enough fields. The basal magma ocean may be able to reach strong enough fields, but the feasibility of whether either of these mechanisms actually work um, is a work in progress <laughs> in terms of establishing that. So one possible way to reconcile this is maybe the lunar field was not always that strong during the high field epoch. Maybe it was variable and you didn't always have to have really intense fields. Maybe it just peaked every once in a while. Um, so what we have done now uh, with G and my student is we're looking at possibilities of variations in the lunar magnetic field during the high field epoch. And the Apollo era data presents some evidence of this, as I mentioned earlier. You could have an order of magnitude variation in Apollo era paleo intensities. But again, we don't know about the fidelity of a lot of these paleo intensity determinations per se. So we need to take another look at the other high field epic samples that have not been restudied. So it turns out that there have actually been a number of samples from the high field epic period of time that have had inconclusive paleomagnetic results. For example, here's an Apollo 17 Mare basalt 75055. And whenever they did AFD magnetization on the sample in Cornette et al. 2012, um, there was a low coercivity overprint, and then it just kind of devolved into noise at higher AF levels. Same thing with Mari Basalt 70215. Um, again, it sort of devolved into noise at high AF levels. So samples like this do not appear to record a strong dynamo field. Now the question is, does this mean that there was no field at all? And would, uh, or does this mean that the field was simply weak? Um, the latter is definitely a real possibility because most lunar basalts are actually really poor recorders of weak magnetic fields. So what we can do in the lab is we can apply ARM and hysteretic remnant magnetization as a laboratory analog for TRM. And we applied ARM to several different Mari basalt samples at um, different TRM equivalent bias field levels. And so uh, basically, if we have a sample with a TRM equivalent field of 35 microtesla or so, we are able to kind of, we applied an ARM and then determine an ARM paleo intensity for uh, the same field level that was applied. And we tried to compare what, how did the laboratory induced paleo intensity compare to the field that we applied? Um, so what we can see is generally, yes, stronger fields, you get stronger paleo intensities back. There's a decent matching with this one-to-one -one line. But as you get to lower and lower field levels, the laboratory re uh, retrieved paleo intensity gets farther apart from the actual applied field value. So another way of looking at this is the percent difference from the paleo intensity versus the applied field. There's good agreement at higher applied fields. And then as you get to below 10 microtesla or so, the error starts to get larger and larger. So what this tells us is that basalts are not the best recorders of fields less than about 10 microtesla or so. Sometimes it's even several tens of microtesla. So this provides some additional evidence that the field may have been variable during the high field epoch. Now, in order to say whether this is actually due to variations in the field, we have to look at some other possibilities. One. Is there a sense that maybe the paleo intensity methods that we're using are not reliable? Um, or are they giving uh, variations you know, using different paleo intensity methods for the same sample? So what uh, my student Jian has been doing is she compiled all the paleo intensity results for specifically basalts that formed during the high field epoch. Um, we wanted to study basalts because they have less complicated impact resetting histories than breccias and impact melt rocks, which might have several generations of heating associated with them. Um, and so what we found was that uh, during the Apollo era, some samples were studied multiple times using different methods. Other studies were only, uh, other rocks were only studied one time during different, using a single method. So um, for example, this sample 70017 during the Apollo era was studied using the KTT Tellier method um, and was also studied using an ARM method. 
The same sample was restudied in the modern era using a saturation isothermal remnant magnetization method. And what they found was there was pretty good agreement between all the paleo intensity methods for this sample. But there's other samples which don't have good agreement, um, like uh, 1017, where this uh, REM C method during the Apollo era was used. That's pretty far apart from the modern SIRM method. So it's possible that. Um, the usage of that one point paleo intensity method, you know, normalizing NRM at 20 millitesla versus SIRM at 20 millitesla is not necessarily giving the best results. So what this tells us is that we need to go back and restudy a lot of these Apollo samples that have not been looked at in the modern era yet. We need to go back and redo those. Um, but another source of variability could be the concept of shock remagnetization of rocks. Now, it's possible that some rocks have been magnetically reset by shock because pretty much every Apollo sample that was picked up on the surface, almost all of them were just regolith float. They were little rocks lying on the lunar surface that had definitely been excavated by some previous impact that had occurred on the moon. And we know from laboratory experiments that if you shock a rock, as the shock wave propagates through a rock, low coercivity grains within a rock will be remagnetized. And if there is a field present, that rock will acquire what's called a shock remnant magnetization. And if there's no field present at the time a shock wave propagates through a rock, you can have shock demagnetization of a rock. So this could yield underestimated paleo intensities. And for example, there was a study done in 2016 by Volk and Gilder which showed that for magnetite bearing rocks, Tellier Tellier paleo intensities could be reduced for magnetite bearing rocks by 10 to 20% per GPA. So, given that rocks with no petrographic evidence of shock could actually have shock, experience shock pressures up to 5 GPA and experience significant reductions in Tellier paleo intensity, this is a uh, concern that needs to be addressed by pressure remagnetization studies. So what we did to actually look into this shock demagnetization possibility was we conducted hydrostatic pressure experiments on a range of lunar samples. So what we did was we studied about seven lunar samples and we took the sample and we put it in a hydrostatic pressure cell, a non-magnetic cell, and we pressurized it using a manual hydraulic press up to about two gigapascals. And what we found was that for each sample, um, each sample lost a different amount of NRM, an increasing amount of NRM upon exposure to higher pressures. And some samples, the pink samples here, were more susceptible to losing their NRM as a result of pressure than some of the blue samples down here, which were more resistant to NRM loss. But in general, if we extrapolate up to five GPA, kind of following these curves, Apollo samples could lose up to about 45% of their natural remnant magnetization by that pressure level. But incidentally, if we use room temperature paleo intensity methods, which are based on AF demagnetization, not thermal demagnetization, and indeed, this is the most common way of doing paleo intensities in lunar rocks because we want to avoid thermal alteration, we don't actually see changes in room temperature paleo intensities. Um, and so the way to read this plot is on the x-axis is the pressure that was applied. And on the y-axis is the normalized paleo intensity for each uh, demagnetization of an original ARM. Um, and we're normalizing it compared to the ARM paleo intensity of a laboratory ARM that was not pressurized. So one is an unpressurized state and then of course, the higher points are for pressurized states. And one thing to keep in mind is the reason that we don't see um, drastic changes in paleo intensity, the reason we only have changes in paleo intensity of about 20% or so for different pressure levels is because in lunar paleomagnetic studies, we, we tend to exclude low coercivity components from our paleo intensity fits. And that's because most lunar rocks have a low coercivity overprint on them. Um, and generally, we don't include level, AF levels of up to 20 millitesla. So if we exclude these low coercivity grains, we don't have much change in the paleo intensity that's retrieved. 
because shock remagnetization is in fact um, constrained to low corrosivity grains, which is kind of cool. So what this tells us is that changes in uh, paleo intensity or variability in paleo intensity that we observe in Apollo era samples are unlikely to be attributed to shock effects. Um, so at least if you're using a room temperature paleo intensity method. Which leaves the third possibility is that maybe we are actually seeing some true field variability in lunar rocks. Um, so what Gian has done is Wait, oh, one minute. Uh, yep, I am pretty much close to the end. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, what Gian has done is we actually took the lunar paleo intensity record that has been published during the Apollo era, which are the black points, and then modern studies, which are the red encircled points. And we calculated the virtual axial dipole moment for the moon based on each of these paleo intensity methods. Of course, this assumes that the moon was an axial dynamo, which may or may not be accurate, but we're using this as a proxy. And what we find if we use all data, or even if we filter the data to things we think are high quality paleo intensity determinations, we have about an order of magnitude variation in paleo intensity for rocks that are from the high field epoch. This is about the same as the variation in VADM that we see in terrestrial rocks over a span of 300 million years. So I think that this is an indication that we might actually be seeing real changes in the lunar magnetic field. So if we want to reinterpret the timeline for the moon, we can say maybe this high field epoch is more of a sometimes high field variable field epoch. There was probably still a decline in lunar paleo intensity. It's probably still a weak field time and probably still a cessation by 1 billion years ago. Now really fast, I'm just going to go through avenues for future exploration in the field. There's two main things that we still need to do. One, we need to fill in the lunar paleo intensity record better. The best way to do this is to analyze more samples. We can go back and analyze more Apollo samples, but this is getting increasingly hard because there's less pristine material left. But we have the Artemis missions on the horizon where um, hopefully in the next few years, NASA will be sending the first woman and the next man to the moon, according to the slogan. Um, and we should be able to get some more rocks from that, hopefully. Um, if that still goes through. And another thing that we could do is we could obtain qualitative results from long roving robotic or crude explorations. So one example of this is a mission concept called Intrepid, which would actually land on the moon and do a thousand kilometer traverse of a rover spanning like over 2 billion years of lunar history. Um, just through one traverse. And we could see how um, the strength of crustal fields kind of changes over time for a qualitative understanding. Another future objective that we need to work on is constraining the geometry of the lunar magnetic field. We need to analyze orientable samples. Some preliminary stabs at this have been done by Cecile Cornet and are actively being done by Claire Nichols um, in terms of finding samples where you can reconstruct paleo-horizontal and then based on that, you could get the inclination of the lunar magnetic field. Um, so that's one possibility. The way things that this is done right now, most of the time is through magnetic inversions of isolated crustal magnetic anomalies. Um, the problem with the crustal magnetic anomaly inversions is that the paleopole locations here on a stereo net that we are getting are kind of like spaghetti. They're all over the map. Um, so the question is, is this real? In which case the moon might have had a dynamo that was not axial or a dynamo that was moving around in kind of a strange way, or um, maybe not all of these fits are accurate for one reason or the other. So that's the second mode of future work that we need to do. So in conclusion, paleomag and crustal mag show that the moon did have a dynamo field. The early, early dynamo at times did rival the strength of the Earth's modern magnetic field, but the average field may have been weaker because there could have been very strong field variations during the so-called high field epoch. Dynamos driven by core convection or core crystallization can explain weak fields, but stronger fields may require non-traditional mechanisms such as precession or a strange mantle evolution where you're temporarily increasing the heat flux at the lunar core. Um, to create temporary spikes in the intensity of the dynamo field. But all in all, additional studies will fill in the temporal gaps in the paleo intensity record. We'll figure out the field geometry, and we will 
combined uh, using these different methods help distinguish between the various proposed dynamo mechanisms for the moon. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Sonia, for that talk. Excellent. Um, any questions? Well, I have one. Um, I was wondering if uh, who's interacting with NASA about uh, where uh, they might want to take samples and if paleomagnetism is uh, high up on the factor of, of scientific study or um, you know what the sort of more details about that. Yeah, so um, right now, the first crewed mission uh, to that will go back to the moon is Artemis three, and that is uh, supposed to go to an area that is near the south pole of the moon. Um, so that has already been fixed. So what's interesting about that is those rocks in that area tend to be about 4 billion years old. So we're going to get some under, or even older. So we'll get some understanding of the earliest history of the moon from samples returned by Artemis III. Um, I actually wrote a white paper along with several other paleomagnetists that kind of um, gave NASA some suggestions for uh, best sampling pra practices using non-magnetic tools, trying to you know, have storage in a non-magnetic environment, so on and so forth. Also, we told them to collect oriented samples. And um, so I think that NASA has some information about what we want from a future collection of lunar rocks, and hopefully they'll actually be able to follow through with that. Um, in terms of priorities for Artemis III, um, there was a science committee that set the priorities. And what they determined was lunar magnetism was sort of a medium priority from their point of view, but it's a it's an exploration that will happen um, because they are definitely collecting samples. So um, the point is that despite how NASA prioritizes us, we are going to be able to do lunar paleomagnetism for sure if we can get samples back. That's great. Um, okay, Wynn? Hi, Sonia. This is uh, Win Williams from Edinburgh. Great talk. I really enjoyed that. I, I had a really simple question, actually. And I, I noticed that you'd um, looked at the effect of uh, hydrostatic pressure, but uh, shouldn't you be looking at sort of shock stresses rather than the effect of hydrostatic pressure? Yeah, so that's sort of the next stage of the experiments that we want to do. But I'd say that if we can extrapolate um, kind of the work of Vulcan Gilder, the shock effects should probably be about twice as strong as the hydrostatic effects. Um, that's my kind of qualitative guess based on okay. their previous work. But nevertheless, I don't necessarily expect the effects to leach into much higher coercivity grains. Um, it will go somewhat higher, but I don't necessarily expect it to be dramatic. Um, based on other kind of non-hydrostatic experiments that have been done on terrestrial rocks and meteorites and things like that. Okay, I'm interested in that problem as well. Maybe you should talk at some other time, but I, I'm beginning to do these sort of calculations using the Micromag, so. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, we, sh we should definitely get together. Happy anyway, to talk. Great talk, thank you. Uh, Andre? Uh, Sonia, great talk. Uh, th th thank you very much. Uh, I have a sort of, uh, well, maybe uh, uh, kind of tangential question, because mm -hmm. um, uh, as, as long as we know the early Earth dynamic, it was weak until, uh, until some people believe the inner core has formed. And uh, we more or less know that early Earth was uh, rotated, uh, was rotating even more rapidly than the um, than the current Earth. But uh, but the Moon has never rotated as uh, fast uh, as um, nearly as fast as, uh, as the Earth. How how does it fit with the uh, with the idea of dynamo? Uh, I mean the slow rotation. Yeah, I'd say that that's an issue that's better dealt with by the magnetohydrodynamic modelers. Um, but generally, you can have strong fields produced in slow rotating bodies. Um, 
Okay. And I will say that there are some, I mean, I didn't talk about it today, but there are some preliminary MHD simulations done by uh, Sabine Stanley's group at Johns Hopkins University. Um, there's a postdoc named Ankit Barrett who's been doing this. And he actually can produce strong fields in a slow rotating moon okay. um, using that mechanism, you know, provided that holds up. Yeah. So. And along this line, uh... Is there any chance to test the former Earth-Moon interaction by paleomagnetism, do you think? You mean um, the interaction? I mean, the uh, I mean, uh, 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 the Moon was much closer to the Earth in the past epochs, so well, particularly well, if we believe this Im mega impact theory of the Moon origin, yeah? And yeah. Uh, do you could it be possible that early Earth uh, acted somehow as a trigger to gener uh, to start the uh, field generation in the moon? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know what the seed field is that you need to initiate a dynamo. Uh, I mean, there's some possibility of you have to have some uh, background field to even make it start. Um, yeah. But uh, one thing, and we, the truth is we don't even necessarily know what the state of the very early Earth's dynamo yes, was. Exactly, <laughs> yes, exactly, I'm not yeah. going to get into it right now. But that's that's, a, that's unfortunately very true, yeah. Uh, open conversation about the Hadean yeah. dynamo. Okay. okay um, but yeah. nevertheless, uh, my, my kind of unrelated short answer is, I get this question a lot, is um, can the Earth's magnetic field explain the lunar paleo intensity record? And the answer is no, because even by four billion years ago, the moon was very far away from the Earth. And yeah, I, uh, the I agree on that, but, like sti now, but still, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Maybe a magnetosphere. I think yeah, we need to move I mean, on to the is... next talk. Oh yeah. Sorry. Oh, time. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Thank you very Thank you. much. Yeah.